Okay, before we get into the discussion questions, I have two announcements I want to make. First is that the school will be announcing that online education will continue until at least April 24th, which is another week. Uh, but I think just to be safe, uh, even on April 27, uh, it will still be, for this class, will still be an online course, uh, just to be safe. So uh, if things don't go bad or go worse, uh, our first uh, in-class course uh, will be in May, just to let you know. And uh, as that data approaches, I will update you on how I have decided uh, or when uh, on my decision uh, regarding this. Secondly, uh, even though we are reading uh, nonfiction, uh, there is still a, a, a kind of plot or a kind of line of development in nonfiction essays. So especially when you're thinking about question six or when you're uh, going to start planning your essays, um, remember that the way to answer that question is very similar to answering it for a short story, a fiction story, which is uh, the quote that you choose uh, should not only uh, be the quote you think express, best expresses the main idea, but you should also use it as an opening point to explore the entire essay, uh, not just its key point, uh, especially because most of the essays we read in like junior high and high school, especially in English class, are all informational nonfiction essays. So uh, perhaps we're used to try read uh, something in order to try to grab its main point. But uh, especially for this kind of essays, I also want you to practice uh, understanding and talking about how uh, the author reaches that point. Uh, as I mentioned la in last week's lecture about uh, Montaigne and uh, the Western essay as an exploration of thought. So it's not just about the conclusion, it's also about how the author reaches that conclusion. And of course, sometimes there won't even be a conclusion to reach. So that's something to keep in mind. Question one. Haunted sometimes adds comments in parentheses. Why do you think she does this? What kind of attitude might they convey about her self-regard? Uh, so most groups, I think all of you, focused only on the first two parentheses, but there are a few more in the essay later as well. Some of these two, three and a half years, will be, and my fourth new city. Uh, now, first of all, you'll notice that these two do add a bit of information or background details to the author's uh, situation. Uh, but as you can tell from the whoopee, it's a, whoopee is a cheer, but it's a sarcastic cheer. You'll never hear anyone use whoopee in a sincere way. It's always sarcastic. So you can also tell that sometimes she's using these to be sarcastic uh, about herself. And you, there are a few more later. Let's take a look. One, cue the cliche. Cue is uh, it, it's something... Uh, used in when making television programs or making movies, it's a signal for something to begin or something to start. And a cliche, of course, is a chen chang lan diao. It's something. It's a tired and worn out idea. And by the way, when you're reading these texts, if there's something you don't understand, please go online to look it up, um, because you know I don't have time to explain everything. Uh, that should be part of your reading process. So cue the cliché means, and this is where the cliché starts. And the cl cliché, of course, is the idea of a, a cat lady, a lonely woman living at home alone with her cats. Uh, and so by pointing out that this is a cliché, she's also trying, uh, being a bit ironic or sarcastic. And I think there's one more later. Two more. First here, reference said poor finances. Uh, reference here means refer to. Said is an adjective, which means uh, as I just mentioned. Uh, 
So earlier in the essay, she mentioned that she doesn't make a lot of money, she hates her job. And here she says that she needs Botox. Botox is a kind of cosmetic surgery uh, for your for skin. Uh, and in Chinese, it's called uh, 肉毒感菌. So here, uh, she's saying, I don't have money, but I need money uh, to maintain my appearance, she thinks. And the, the tone of this parenthetical edition is a bit academic, a bit serious. Uh, and so the difference in tone between the conversational tone of the essay or the letter and this particular edition creates irony as well. And then there's one more here. Here she's saying uh, when if uh, or when she starts a new relationship, she feels a lot of pressure because of her age. Uh, she, uh, she feels pressure to make something of the relationship. And by make something of it, uh, she adds, uh, she, or she explains in this parenthesis, she means move in, get married, I have to have kids in a couple of years. And this last part is in quotation marks, which means this is something that she feels she has to say uh, to uh, her partner uh, so that they're both clear on uh, what she wants and so that they're not wasting each other's time. But of course, when you meet someone new, uh, it doesn't matter if a man says this or a woman says this. Uh, if, it, if you're just starting the relationship, it creates a lot of pressure. It's not good for the relationship. It's the opposite of uh, what she calls this, fun times. Not fun at all. So this is also sarcastic directed toward herself. Uh, so going back to the question, Uh, why do you think she does this? She's being sarcastic. Uh, what kind of, uh, toward herself? She's mocking herself. It's called being uh, self-deprecating. Uh, and why does she does this? Uh, let me spell deprecating for you. Self-deprecating, which means mocking yourself. What kind of attitude might they, or these comments, convey about her self-regard? Um, well, the reason that she feels a need to be sarcastic and ironic is, I think, to create distance. Irony always creates distance. But distance from what? Um, most of the time, when a complete stranger shows you their raw, powerful emotions, it can be pretty awkward, and I think it's because um, when someone shows you their true emotions, it creates a responsibility or implies implies a responsibility for the listener to have empathy or to show concern or to, to show that they care. And especially if the emotions are powerful and you don't know this person, uh, that responsibility may not be welcome. So. Uh, the, uh, the author, Haunted, knows this. She's writing to a stranger, and she doesn't want to come off like too strong in her emotions and too awkward. So she tries to make it uh, create a distance between those emotions and the letter itself. Uh, and so, as some of you mentioned, it creates a lighter atmosphere. It, it uses a little humor to make things lighter. Um, but uh, also, some of you mentioned that... Uh, it makes her seem more pathetic in that it makes her seem more pitiful like we want to take pity on her um, and this it, it's true and it might be because even in a letter asking for help she still doesn't feel safe enough to simply express her emotions but she still worries about whether the reader of her letter uh, in this case Polly might be uh, repulsed or put off by how strong her emotions are. So even when she's asking for help, she still doesn't feel safe enough. And that does uh, induce pity in the reader. It does make her seem pathetic. Uh, but this also goes to answer the last part of the question, the attitude she has about herself, how she looks at herself. And I think that this shows that she has pity on her own self. Uh, she herself can't face, truly face, her situation and so she feels the need and she, she knows that it's pitiful and pathetic to other people or at least that's how she fears people will look at her 
and so uh, she she does she has a very low self esteem about this, and that's why she feels the need to use irony uh, when talking about her problems. Question two. Polly says about a negative feeling that you can take that feeling and keep it company instead of letting it eat you alive. What do you think she means? So let's take a look at that. Uh, Specifically, she, uh, Polly is talking about the credit card bills, but in general, I think this applies to Haunted's entire situation. Polly says, uh, well, I just read the quote. You know what it says. Um, what does that mean? Well, if you notice, Polly's entire response is about how the problem, the, well, of course, uh, Haunted's uh, life situation is not the best situation, but the biggest problem is that the situation makes haunted feel shame, and shame causes all kinds of negative emotions and stops you from doing lots of great things. So here, Polly is talking about that shame or that shameful feeling. Instead of letting it eat you alive, you can take it and keep it company. So, so what what are these two options? Letting it eat you alive, uh, as a few of you mentioned, is the idea that. It keeps a constant pressure on you. You can't face uh, all of the things that make you feel shame. You try to run away from it. Um, and by running away, you aren't able to create things that are valuable. You're simply avoiding a kind of problem. Uh, and this is, uh, we have to be careful when we talk about this because as Haunted notes in her letter, she is trying. She works hard at her job, she tries to save money, she's seeing uh, possible romantic partners. So she's not literally running away from her problems. It's a question of attitude. Uh, and Polly uh, says this in more detail slightly later. using her own experience as an example. Uh, and she says here, uh, when I'm hiding from my shame and also viewing my life through the lens of that shame, I get fixated on what needs fixing. But nothing needs fixing, actually. I need to come back to reality and live there instead. So here we also have the same two options. Uh, and it looks like the first one is to be fixated on fixing problems. Um, and what this means is, of course, as I just mentioned, problems do need to be fixed. You can't just avoid problems. You still have to try to resolve them. But the difference in mindset is here, uh, the idea seems to be that it is, if I can just solve these problems, my life will be better and I can turn things around and I can start doing what I really want to do. So it's a mindset of problems fixing, uh, fixing these problems first and then getting on with my life. But Polly is saying that uh, you need to come back to reality and live there. In other words, at, fixing problems is a part of your life. Your life it does not wait for you to fix all of your problems. Uh, and so that's what that means, uh, letting shame keep you company, or you keep it company. It's not uh, trying to resolve problems to get over shame, to throw shame away, so that you can start living your full life. It's realizing that shame is also part of your life. And so as shame motivates you to solve your problems, uh, you accept it as a necessary part of life. And uh, this is what Polly talks about near the end of this paragraph. Saying get, get rid of shame. She herself says, my shame is the fuel that keeps me writing. My shame is the fuel that makes me exercise. So it is a kind of motivation, but you can't let it, as, as Polly says, eat you alive. You can't treat it as the enemy. It's just another part of life. Not a good part of life, 
but it's it is a part of life. And that brings us to question three. How do Hansit and Pauli conceive of being an artist differently if they do so? And which conception do you agree with more and why? Uh, so I think all, uh, yes, all five groups agree that there are two different conceptions of being an artist. And most of you said that uh, Pauli thinks of being an artist as a way of life, as a way of living, as a way of looking at life and not just uh, what we usually think of as art. Uh, a few groups had different answers for the first part. How does Polly think of art? Uh, some of you mentioned that Haunted thinks you have to solve all your problems and live an artist lifestyle in order to be an artist, uh, which that, that makes sense. Uh, and some of you pointed out that Haunted seems not want uh, to not want to do art, but to be an artist, uh, which is like saying you don't want to read a book, you want to be a person who has read the book. Um, and I, that does make sense also. Um, but we should also uh, note how they aren't just thinking about being an artist differently, they're also thinking about art differently. Usually when we mention art, we think of like paintings and music and stuff like that. Uh, but if we, and that seems to be the kind of way that Haunted is thinking about art. But if we follow Polly's idea of art, then uh, it's not about what you create from your artistic viewpoint. Uh, although creating is important, and the, Polly's response mentions being able to create uh, works of art. But it's more about the ability to view life and view experiences as uh, either material for art, the source of art, or even the, the viewing itself as art. Um, and in a way, you can say that this is kind of what uh, films are doing. Film as an art form is showing the audience a way to see things in life. Uh, th that could be more artistic. And of course, I'm not talking about like Spider-Man. I'm talking about like artistic films. Um, and most of you agreed with Polly's conception of art as a lifestyle. Uh, and it does sound more appealing, or it does sound more authentic or genuine. Like this is the kind of person that you uh, expect to be a true artist, or you expect a true artist to live like that. But uh, Polly's conception of art and being an artist is also exhausting. Like, I'm sure that uh, you've had the experience where someone wants you to try to uh, experience or appreciate a work of art, whether it's a painting, a piece of music, a piece of writing, and you, you look at it and you try very hard to experience it, and you get a glimpse of the beauty and the value of that work of art. And then afterwards, you go back to your daily life, uh, finishing your homework, talking to friends. Um, and it's because being an artist and seeing everything as art all the time is exhausting, it's tiring, uh, and it's also not very helpful for when you have to do things like wash the dishes or like do the laundry or you know do your homework. Um, so uh, both, I think both conceptions of art are important. Art as a way of seeing things, definitely, because you have to be able to see things artistically in order to truly be uh, someone who can create meaningful art. But also, it's important if you want to, to maintain a lifestyle as an artist, uh, to work toward a life that doesn't have too many pressures and too many demands on your time. Uh, and that's part of what Haunted is writing about. Uh, she says that she works all day. When she comes home, she's exhausted and tired. She doesn't have the energy for art. And it is true that if that is the lifestyle that you have, it's less likely that you will be able to do the kind of art that you want. Uh, even mentally, if you're exhausted by your work, you don't have the energy to look at everything artistically. Uh, so I think both are important. 
you can't just think of being an artist as being someone who like shows their paintings in galleries and is famous and rich. Uh, but it's also important to think about the material conditions of being an artist and being able to do art. Okay, break time. Group three uh, really, really, really wanted me to show you guys this picture. And they say that this expresses the main idea of the essay very well, they think. And I do think it's close. Um, and so you can take a look at this picture uh, while you take a break, go to the restroom, take a deep breath, walk around, pet your dog, whatever. Speaking of dogs, um, I've had to record this lecture over so many times because my own dog won't shut up. She keeps barking and it's very noisy. But she's cute though. So, so at least, uh, you know, she's cute and we still love her. Question four. Near the end, Polly tells a story about a 93-year-old woman. Why do you think she does this? How might it relate to the rest of her response? Uh, and all of you noticed that the idea of looking back at, or the suggestion for Haunted to look back at her life from a point in her future is not just about, uh, it's not just, you know, a single suggestion. It, it, the suggestion was made more than once. And let's take a look. Um, here, there's a place earlier, hang on. Learn to treat yourself the way a loving older parent would. Uh, so to look at yourself from uh, the point of someone who is older, an older parent. And then the second instance, You are 95 years old looking back at your 35 year old self. And from this thought experiment, Polly transitions into a conversation with an actual 93 year old woman. Polly talks about this is also very smart because it's not just saying, see, this woman actually exists. It's possible. You can do it. Jayo. Uh, but she, she, begins this example by talking about how hard it was for Polly herself to talk with this 93-year-old woman. Uh, throughout the essay, Polly has been trying to build empathy with Haunted by mentioning how she herself does not have all the answers. She herself is not perfect. She herself understands what Haunted is going through a bit, uh, if not uh, as extreme, uh, but at least something similar. And so here she also says, uh, how she felt a little embarrassed, a little shameful, uh, going to visit this 93-year-old woman. And at the end, uh, Polly feels happier and more joyful. And uh, so she thinks that this example, a, a real person, could be uh, inspiring to Haunted and could help Haunted, to, could help Haunted see uh, what Polly means in her answer. Uh, and so that's uh, what she's doing uh, using this story near the end. I want to talk a bit more about the idea of looking back at yourself from 95 years old or 93 years old. In the essay, Polly is 35. So 95 is like almost three times her age. And for you, you're probably in your uh, late teens, early 20s. So 95 for you is almost five times your age. Think about that. Everything you remember from your earliest memory, through your childhood, through your earliest days of school, junior high, high school, all the way to this year, this crazy year, everything you know is only one-fifth of what uh, that woman has experienced. It is only one-fifth of the length of time that that woman has been on Earth. K-12 
Can you imagine how much experience and how much life that woman has lived through? Thinking about all that you know as being only 20%, one-fifth of what someone else has experienced really does give a perspective to all of your experiences, problems, frustrations, achievements, dreams, everything you think you know about life. It gives you a totally different way of looking about it, and looking at it, and thinking about it. And so, uh, from that angle, it's even more amazing that um, this woman says uh, she's had a lot of experiences, made a lot of mistakes, but she doesn't mind talking about them. She's very honest. Uh, you would think that the more you know, the more careful you are. Uh, but we see here that uh, living such a long life, her conclusion about life seems to be that the most important thing is to be honest with yourself and with other people, to be, as she later says, a human being, a real human being. It's kind of like cutting through all of the unnecessary distractions that you're faced with every day in life and reaching the really important thing, which is human connection. Uh, and so hopefully if ever you feel frustrated at something in life, uh, looking back at your point in life uh, from the far future, from the point of someone who has been through so much and has understood so much, uh, could be a way to drag yourself out of a depressed mindset. Question 5. Do you think Polly successfully answers Haunted? In other words, do you think Haunted would find this response satisfactory? Why or why not? And if not, what do you think could be added? Um, so I, some groups took one answer, some groups took another. Uh, if you I read your responses saying that some of you thought it was a successful answer because it, it replied to all of the points that Haunted brought up and it, it was a convincing answer and it showed exactly what Haunted had to do to solve her problems. But some of you also said it was not a, su a successful answer because uh, what she's basically asking Haunted to do is not anything uh, concrete but simply to look at her own life from a different angle. And asking someone to look at something from a different perspective is one of the hardest things uh, you can ask them to do. And in fact, if, if Haunted was already able to do that, then uh, she wouldn't have the need to write this letter to ask Polly for help in the first place. So some of you had mentioned that what Haunted really needs is empathy, uh, saying, seeing someone agree with them and say they understand uh, your pain, understand your suffering, and that we'll get through this together, something like that. But to really have that change of perspective requires an epiphany. Epiphany, I think in Chinese, is dun wu. A, a single moment where you suddenly realize uh, how things could be different. And uh, even the best letter in the world does not guarantee the reader will have this kind of epiphany. And I think both answers make sense. Um, we can look at this question, or we can answer this question uh, from two perspectives. One being how Polly... Uh, so Polly thinks of a solution for haunted. And so one question could be, how successfully does Polly express that answer or convey that answer? How clear and complete is her answer? And the second part of uh, the second way to answer this question would be, is that answer itself, is the idea that Polly has enough for haunted? Would it really solve haunted's problems? So the first part, uh, how clear and complete is Polly's answer? And the answer, I think, is really, really complete. Let's take a closer look. 
So Polly has read Haunted's letter. She has understood what she wants to, uh, what Haunted is trying to say, and Polly has pinpointed the single biggest problem in Haunted's life, which is the problem of shame. Uh, and so, uh, the first two paragraphs of Polly's answer uh, sets forth this main idea and creates an opposition between art and shame because art is what Haunted says she wants to pursue. So, the idea of art is a way of life and not simply uh, a, an activity or creating uh, like a painting, but it's a way of living life, according to Polly. The opposite of that is shame. Shame is what prevents you from doing art or living uh, an artistic lifestyle or seeing life through the lens of art. And so starting from this main idea, uh, then Polly goes into more detail. Since shame is the opposite of art, you need to discard some of this shame. And, but even if you can't get rid of all that shame, shame becomes valuable. Already here, you can see that the answer Polly is giving isn't some concrete action, but simply a way of looking at things differently, even looking at shame differently. Shame is not something you have to get rid of. It's something that has its own value that you should try to explore and understand. Uh, and so this paragraph talks in general about facing your shame and accepting it and seeing the value in it. Uh, the next paragraph uh, builds, or it doesn't build, it transitions from the, the previous paragraph. If the previous paragraphs are talking about what the answer is, this paragraph starts to talk about how you can implement that answer, how you get to that place. And uh, Polly does this by acknowledging that the, there is a distance between her answer and Haunted's current situation. Polly says, that doesn't mean it's easy. It's not easy for anyone. And she uses herself as an example to sort of build a relationship with Haunted to say that I'm not just uh, someone sitting on a cloud giving you answers. I've been through this. I'm talking from my own experience. And the next paragraph continues with that experience. Uh, by the way, uh, usually when we give advice, we don't promote our own books. But remember, this is not a private letter. This is a public letter. It's a column. It's written for a, an online magazine for readers, aside from Haunted, to read and hopefully draw inspiration and comfort from. Uh, and also, the way that Polly handles this uh, book promotion thing is very, very uh, careful and empathetic. She's bringing up her book only because this is the reason why she is on a book tour, to promote the book. Uh, the rest of this paragraph would make no sense if she didn't mention that she had a new book that she's promoting. And from her own experience, Polly continues to uh, explain what shame does to you or to people. She comes back to her original answer, which is, uh, you've got to treat shame differently. In explaining what you have to do, Polly uses herself as an example. This is how she has treated her own shame differently. Again, builds more empathy and relationship with Haunted by saying, look, I may have successfully begun this process, uh, but I'm not judging you for not doing that. I understand that the first step is very hard, so I'm not uh, criticizing you, I'm simply showing you how I did it. And I know that you're trying very hard, I know that you're uh, in a lot of suffering right now. This paragraph is very smart. Building on the last one, I know you're suffering a lot, but here Polly is saying, a lot of your suffering doesn't make sense. Um, and especially the part about staying beautiful and having to have a baby really quickly, which is the next paragraph here. Um, and you'll notice that, um, well, the, the uh, biological basis of a woman's fertility is hard to ignore. It is 
mathematically and scientifically true that uh, pregnancy and birth at, for instance, age 48 is riskier uh, than at age 35 or even at age 25. So uh, Polly can't say that part is wrong or that part makes no sense. So instead what she says is uh, the, the important thing isn't whether you have children. The important thing is uh, how you treat uh, children or how you understand the idea of having children. The idea of raising someone or caring for someone. Uh, and here she's saying you need to treat yourself like a treasured child. If you want to take care of your child adequately and successfully, you first have to be clear about how to take care of people in general and you specifically, yourself specifically. Uh, and Polly doesn't mention it, but um, if you uh, don't want to risk an uh, older age pregnancy, uh, there are other ways, right? You can, as Hunter is considering, you can freeze uh, your eggs. Uh, if you don't have money, you can, you know, borrow some, take out a loan. There are ways. Or you can consider adoption. Uh, or uh, if you're lucky, the person that you're dating may already have a child. Uh, and of course, these options are not equal to each other. Uh, but the idea here in this paragraph is that the answer to your problem is not a single answer. Uh, there are different ways of looking at it. There are different options that you can think about. And the important thing is to be ready for taking care of a child and not just to have a child in front of you. And here we have the first paragraph about treating yourself or looking at yourself from an older perspective. The next paragraph again goes back to building empathy. Uh, I, I, uh, Polly is saying, I'm asking you to do these things, but I understand where you are and that's okay. She keeps emphasizing that uh, not having done already what Polly says she should do is not uh, judgment is not a criticism. It's not a bad thing. Uh, the first step in overcoming shame is accepting yourself. So Polly is actually helping Haunted to accept herself as well. Uh, and here again, Polly goes back to her own example. Uh, thing, specific things that she has been doing. The ways that she has been facing her own shame. And this paragraph is a conclusion that Polly has reached about facing shame about uh, viewing life uh, through the lens of shame or the lens of uh, value and art. And here, as, uh, these two paragraphs finally give Haunted specific suggestions. And it comes so late because the important part of Polly's answer is the mindset, the attitude, the perspective. If Haunted follows these suggestions in these two paragraphs without changing how she views her life and herself, then her problems will not be resolved. She will still have her same problems. Maybe even worse, because some of these suggestions are basically saying, go further into debt, take a bigger risk. Uh, and that's very painful and, and scary if you don't have the right mindset, if you're not prepared for it. Uh, and here, going back to looking at yourself from an older age, in order to transition to the actual story of the 93-year-old woman. And then after the story ends, she draws that conclusion out from the story. All you have to be is a human being. That's success. And of course, being a fully human person is the hardest thing to do. Uh, when we're living our daily lives and we have things we have to do, we have... Uh, uh, homework we have to do, chores we have to do, we have uh, tasks and frustrations and worries and things to remember. None of that is being human, right? That's just being like a machine, finishing things. Uh, to be truly human is to be to have a true connection with other people, to truly experience things with other people. And that's one of the hardest things you can do in the world. So the form of the answer is quite complete. But is this answer enough for Haunted? Uh, 
Well, to help us answer this part of the question, I actually reached out to the author, Heather Haverleski. Uh, I follow her on Twitter. And I emailed her question five and asked her what she thought. And this is her reply. Uh, I'll read a few. Uh, I'll read a, a few parts of it. I'll read the whole thing, actually. Why not? Hi, CJ. Thanks for the kind words. The person who wrote the letter actually wrote back to me and thanked me for it, and told me that she'd experienced a kind of paradigm shift about her entire life that was helping her a lot. So, hey, look. It turns out that the letter actually worked. Uh, the the advice was really helpful, and that's that's a great thing to hear. And notice that uh, the author notes that it was a Paradigm shift. The paradigm shift in Chinese is dianfan zhuan yi, and it basically just means changing perspectives, or having an epiphany about different perspectives. And apparently, Haunted uh, thought that this was very helpful for her. Now, uh, I also asked uh, the author about um, the difference between writing a public letter and a private letter, because in a private letter, I don't think she would have promoted her book, and also because. As the end of the text notes, here, all the letters become the property of this company and will be edited for length, clarity, and grammatical correctness. So the letter from Haunted that we see is not exactly the same as the letter that Polly received. That letter was also edited for public reading, uh, and editing for.、Uh, Grammatical correctness—that's fine. I mean, everybody would want that. But editing for length and clarity basically means that the words and the sentences are cut or shifted around or organized in a more clear way, and that is changing the the letter itself. So I also asked uh, uh, the author about、uh, the difference between writing public letters and private letters, and she said. If it were a private letter to a friend, you couldn't take the same liberties, which means that there are some things you have to be more careful about. It's hard to say to a friend, "You have a lot of shame that you need to address," or "You should see your life through the eyes of an artist and recognize that everything adds up and matters." And by the way, these are—you can say—these are the main ideas of the essay. Most people aren't open to that kind of information from their friends. And、um, this is interesting because mostly we think about friendship as closer relationships, like you could say anything to your friends,、uh, but you have to be careful with strangers. But here, the author is saying that that's not always true, because when、uh, I think her idea is、uh, when you're friends with someone, you have a relationship with that person, which means you have a responsibility、uh, for that relationship. You have to care more about how. Your friend feels when you give them advice. You can't just say, "Here's the answer. Good luck." You also have to be、uh, in the right time and place, and and make sure your friend is prepared for the answer. And you have to make sure your friend is willing to listen to advice. A lot of times, people complain not to get advice, but simply to get sympathy and a shoulder to cry on, or someone who says, "I understand." And at that point, if you try to give them advice, Uh, they may feel uh, like not ready to accept it, or even offended、uh, for some people. So here, the author is saying that writing a public letter is actually、uh, simpler. You simply have to explain your answer clearly, and that's it.、Um, so that's what the author says. That's what、uh, Polly says.、Uh, but you, we should also remember that.、Uh, The author's ideas don't have to determine how you understand the essay. Like if you if you have a question about something and the author explains it, that explanation is not automatically correct.、Um, you have, still have to evaluate that answer in the context of the entire essay or the entire text.、Um, but this letter from the author does answer one of our questions, which is, does Uh, did the response really work? And the answer is yes, it did, and so that's good. Question six: Which sentence or sequence of at most three sentences do you think best expresses the main idea of the essay, and why?、Um, so let's look at、uh, all of your answers.、Uh, 
Uh, first is group three. You guys chose when you're a human being, life feels satisfying. And uh, your answer says, uh, haunted thinks her life is miserable and she has no contribution which she has done so far. This is why she describes herself as a ghost. Uh, but in Polly's opinion, haunted must have already done a lot of things, just she doesn't know yet. If she stops thinking that she is a ghost but a human being, she will eventually find out what she has accomplished. Uh, so this is, in, in a very broad outline, this is uh, what the essay is saying. But for each sentence here, if you write an essay about uh, this text, uh, for each sentence you need to give a lot of examples and you need to explain the specific parts of these ideas. So, Haunted thinks her life is miserable. Why? From what aspects? And she has no contribution. Again, what kind of contribution is Haunted thinking about? And in Polly's response, she must have done a lot of things. Where does it say that? Uh, she has to stop thinking she's a ghost but an actual human being. What does that mean? How does she do that? Are there examples? Give a lot more details to this answer. And also try to connect it to uh, the quote that you chose. So the human being part, that's there. But also life feels satisfying. So... Does that mean that Haunted currently is not satisfied by her life? Why not? And how does being a fully human being give you that kind of satisfaction? So try to con uh, give more detail and connect it uh, more closely to the second half of the quote that you chose. Okay, let's look at the next group. Group 5. This is not at most three sentences. This is a lot of sentences. Um, each period ends a sentence. So uh, next time, try to choose at most three. Otherwise, you know, if it's too long, you can put anything in there. And that's not a good way to begin interpreting a text. Anyways, here's what you chose. It's okay to be in debt and worried. It's okay to feel lonely and lost. It's okay to feel tired of trying. It's okay to want more and wonder how to get it. You're just a human. This is how we feel a lot. It's not irregular or aberrant to feel despair. This is part of survival. And you chose this because, uh, as you say, we think that accepting ourselves, embracing our imperfections, and facing ourselves with a positive attitude is what human beings really do during our whole life. That's how we live and learn to be real human beings. Um... And I don't exactly agree with the second half of your answer. The first half, accepting yourself, embracing imperfections, facing yourself, uh, is important. And with a positive attitude, maybe that sounds a bit too strong. Uh, you can accept yourself with a negative attitude if you want, as long as you are truly accepting yourself and realizing what you truly are, what kind of person you truly are, what kind of situation you are truly in. Uh, the advice to always be positive can also be a lot of high pressure, especially when you're depressed or miserable. So the important thing is acceptance. Uh, and the last part of your answer is, that's how we live and learn to be real human beings. Um, or, or sorry, the middle part is that's what human beings do, really do in life. Uh, and I don't think that's true either. A lot of us go about in our daily lives not facing ourselves, not accepting our problems, not facing our shame. Uh, and that may, make, that may make us less human, but we are still human. Uh, that also, the idea of being unable to accept yourself is also part of being human. And that is also something that we should accept. We, that we should try to accept the fact that we often cannot face ourselves. Um, but uh, successfully facing ourselves, embracing our imperfections, and accepting ourselves, uh, warts and all, uh, you know, the good and the bad, is, I agree, how we learn to be real human beings, fully human beings. Now, the thing about your answer is, You'll have to connect each of these ideas uh, with things in the essay to give more detail to show that you are trying to interpret and understand uh, the whole essay. So uh, your reason for this, the quote itself has 
negative aspects and positive aspects. So there is an opening there, um, assuming you can choose the right three sentences from this uh, sequence of sentences. What is it, like seven? It's a lot. Uh, but the reason that you give sort of ignores the negative part. Uh, and it's hard to connect your reason with the first half of the text, the letter written by Haunted. So when you choose a quote, remember it's something that you uh, should try to connect to, the, uh, to every part of the essay, and not only to the main idea. Uh, because to fully explain the main idea, you have to uh, show why it is the main idea. And it's a main idea because it connects with every part of the essay. Group 4. You guys chose because instead of running away from the truth, you welcome it in. You don't treat what you have as pointless. You work with what you have. And this does seem like a, a really important idea here. Uh, and in your explanation for this quote, the first paragraph, you, you note that Haunted is blinded from what she has. The second paragraph, you say that uh, by welcoming the truth, you see what you have and uh, you, be, you are able to become more creative and resilient. And you also bring in Carl Rogers, which... I mean, if you, you can if you want to, um, and if you do that, please give a source for where Carl Rogers says something that you think is relevant. Um, I, I'm not exactly in full agreement with the idea that the more con genuine and consistent we are, the more integrated we are, and the closer we are to our true selves. I'm not, like, this is a personal opinion. It's not something that we can see from uh, the essay or our discussion today, but I don't think that we really do have a true, one true self. I think that as long as we are in the moment and fully experiencing and fully open to each moment and each experience, that that is a true uh, experience, a true side of ourselves. So it's not just one true self. It's, it changes according to different situations and different relationships. Uh, but it is important to be integrated, to feel that these different aspects make up the same person. It doesn't mean you have to be always consistent all the time, uh, however. Uh, the idea of being a hypocrite or be, having uh, double standards for people, I think, is natural. Uh, the standards change according to who we are interacting with, uh, what kind of relationship it is. Uh, and uh, most people in the world do treat ourselves better than we treat other people, or we criticize ourselves uh, less and forgive ourselves more than we do for other people. Most of us. If you're not that kind of person, uh, you, then you're probably the opposite. You forgive yourself less, and you treat yourself more harshly than you do other people. And that's not healthy either. Um, try to remember that you are simply another person. And there's, there's not necessarily one true standard for interacting with everybody, including yourself. I think the standard is different for interacting with every different person, including yourself. Um, anyway, that's a digression. Coming back to your answer. Third paragraph, Honda keeps mentioning what she lacked, but and Polly doesn't deny this, uh, but instead she tells her to examine reality differently. And finally, uh, it's more important how you treat what you've been through because everything can become part of the energy that pushes you forward. Uh, so I think this is a, the beginning or the, the outline of a good response essay, uh, but for each part try to add specific quotes and specific details um, that give the reader of your essay a fuller picture of how Polly understands Haunted's question and how Polly tries to answer it. Group two. Okay, you guys have two answers. One, build something else from your shame instead. And this is a good a choice. It's the turning point between shame and creativity. Uh, and you guys explain that shame is not absolutely bad. It's a different experience. can help us improve. It's not just inevitable, but also essential. And that's true. 
Uh, but again, when you turn this into an essay, explain this in a lot more detail, starting from Haunted's idea that shame is uh, that shame is bad. Of course, Haunted doesn't call it shame, but what she sees is all full of shame, and she says that all of it, or she thinks of all of it as bad. So start from there, and then you can transition into Polly's answer about the value of shame and and uh, how it can be a motivator for us to. Uh, improve ourselves. Give a lot more detail. And the second one you chose is all you have to be is a human being haunted. Uh, and you say that this choice shows how it's normal to have a lot of negative emotions. It's normal to be like this for every human being. Uh, and shame doesn't come from your experience but from how you look at it. And from here you can start going into more detail about specifically what Polly uh, advises haunted to do. So again, a lot more detail about negative emotions and, and how we look at those emotions uh, through shame, and a lot more detail about how instead we can look at it through the idea of value. Group one. You guys chose, it's time to come out of hiding, it's time to step into the light and be seen, shame and wrinkles and failures and fears and all. This is also a good choice, uh, because in your quote, uh, you have the idea of facing yourself, but you also have a small and short list of all of the different things that uh, Haunted is running away from. Being seen, shame, wrinkles, uh, career failures and personal failures, fears about the future. This is basically a very short summary of the entirety of uh, Haunted's letter. And so this is a good opening into... Uh, discussing what Haunted writes about. Um, and your reason for this answer is uh, also, the, I think, a good understanding of the main idea. Uh, but again, when you write an essay, you have to go into much more detail uh, about all of the things that you list in the first line, uh, in the second line, in, in all the lines, just into much more detail. Uh, okay, so that's uh, our discussion for this week. Next week we're reading the essay Living with Ghosts by Evelyn Deshane. Uh, this essay is a film essay, which means it's, an, it's a personal essay about films. And as you might have guessed, the films in question are horror films. Um, but the way that the author uh, experiences and understands horror films I think could be very different from your own experience. So that's something worth reading about. Also, uh, I want to point out that the name Evelyn today is a, is a female name, but it used to be a, a male name. And that's very interesting because the author is also not someone with a traditional gender. And that will come across as you read the essay as well. So remember, as you read, to pay attention not just to the main idea, but to how the main idea is developed, the journey of thought of the entire essay. And also, for anything you don't understand, please take the time to look it up uh, online. You don't have to watch all of the horror movies that the essay mentions. I don't want to scare you to death. Uh, and I think that it's a successful essay because even if you have never seen those movies, um, the way that the author talks about them gives you a general understanding and enough information for you to understand what the essay is trying to say. Uh, but of course, if you like watching horror movies, this is a good excuse to watch a few of them. See you next week.